I've added some water to this. I've made it looser. As the shadow gets closer to you, the colors underneath come out, the, sun, the light changes. But first, let's get right to our guest, Barbara Tapp. Barbara, are you there? I'm here, to Eric. Hi. All right. All right. Now, I know you're going to start teaching, and that's really good. But throughout this, I'm going to tell a couple of stories about you. Uh, I hope you don't mind. Oh, no, of course I don't. I'm sure they're going to be amusing to somebody out there. Yeah, they will be amusing. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and let you get started with your training. Thank you, actually. Um, well, I, I have to start with where this inspiration began. Uh, I'm always searching for new things to do. Uh, I'm a work in progress. I've said this before. Uh, I was attending Watercolor Live, and um, this was only in January, at the end of January, and I had an aha moment, and it was extraordinary. It was after watching Birgit O'Connor uh, when she was describing the color wheel and for some reason or another, the refresher on that uh, made me very excited about color again. And then there was a demo by Tom Lynch. And this is the sample that I wanted to show you, is that this was his reference that he gave us. And this is the painting that I did from it. So there was a combination of using Birgit O'Connor's color wheel that she reminded me of an analogous colors, uh, complementary colors, things like that. So I wanted to experiment from my regular normal plant painting. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. I mean, you, you are an experienced painter. You've made your living as an artist for many, many years. Uh, why on earth would somebody like you at your level attend something like Watercolor Live or Plein Air Live? Because I don't know everything and I'm a student. I, I th I, 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 you're not like me. I thought I knew everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's quite fascinating. You, you, you know, we can always learn and continue to learn. And a lot of people read books. I'm better with visuals. And uh, Watercolor Live and Plein Air Live, which I do them all, Realism Live, I find that I have this concentrated um, focus by being in a studio um, I, and I can actually follow through at my own pace, which is really good. But the one thing is that I am primarily a plein air painter. So when I go out into the field, I don't get to practice before I actually paint. I paint and react immediately. And uh, so by doing this, by actually uh, the aha moment that came from actually the Tom Lynch thing was to change the colours in my shadows um, and that in itself then this was the next one I did uh, again, can you lower I that a little bit so we can see it no lower it there you go perfect um, this absolutely blew my socks off uh, I was so excited I couldn't wait to get out into the field and what happened here was this isolation of uh, putting darks in before I actually painted the rest of the painting. And I think the samples that you showed gave an example of how by putting your darks in first, you didn't have to go around chasing and waiting to put your darks in at the end. And if you're a plein air painter, often those shadows and those shapes have already gone. So this approach that revealed itself allowed me to actually come in when I was immediately stimulated and interested and excited about what I was seeing outdoors in the plein air situation. And I could actually then put in all the darks and I had another aha moment at the plein air convention, which were uh, not plein air convention, at the plein air uh, watercolour live. And this came from where I started my first experiment on it. Uh, this was the, uh, sorry, upside down. Um, this was the reference that we were given. It was in the evening time when we got to paint. And I did my own design, but I put in all my darks around the shapes here, freehanding it. And then the next step I did was this, which shows that I, it's creating a value sketch basically in your, uh, before you actually paint. The biggest aha moment was when I realized that I could paint over the blue 
and I had all these new colors that suddenly came to the fore. It's so dynamic, so different to anything I've ever done before. A, a real, it opened a door, and I think that in painting, we want to feel like we're growing. Yeah, absolutely. This, pardon? Absolutely. And in this case, I have grown enormously. I mean, it, it's, it's very exciting. So I would like to start by showing you a breakdown of basically the darks that I'm choosing to work with when I'm in the field. As I said, I'm a plein air painter. I don't paint in my studio. I don't have a lot of time to practice. So starting with cobalt blue, which is basically the reflected sky on any surface that you're in the outdoors, this is the value scale. So I'm working from the full pigment. Oh, I also forgot to mention that I am a primarily a watercolorist. I don't do any other medium. Uh, down to my whitest white. And what I do is then I take ultramarine, Van Dyke brown, burnt uh, Quinn Sienna. I mix with the, co the ultramarine and the Quinn pink, and I create a purple as well. And then I step it another step so that I'm actually creating another dark. So this is pure pigment. This is actually where I've got a mix of the cobalt mixed with each one of these. Can you lower that down just about three? There we go, right there. Okay, all right. Um, and, and this is just giving me a way of getting my darkest dark for where I want to put it in in my painting. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how I go about creating. This is, these are little exercises. And I think if anyone wants to try what, get a feel for what this is like, Eric, take a photograph that you've taken, obviously, yourself in a sketchbook and put it up above you so that you have it, your reference close by. So is that, a printed, is that a printed out photograph? Yeah, just from my computer. Yeah. And these are all my photographs. I never, I never use references from anybody else. So I hate to admit it, but I have 44,000 photographs on my iPhone. Only 44,000? Only 44,000. When I go to the Apple person to get a new phone, they look at me and they say, hmm, well, you're the biggest record we've ever seen of photographs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'll, I'd be willing to compete with you on that one. Oh, that's good to hear. Now I don't feel so guilty. All right, so I'm going to start here. I'm going to show you that I use, these are my brushes. I use the black, the silver black velvet brush. Uh, I use Princeton brushes. I use the hake for texture. All right. I use the cat tongue silver black velvet. All right. I have my palette is here. And what I do is to every palette I make. Can you lower I, that down a little bit so we can see? There we go. Over to the right a little. There we go. A little more. Okay. So I date the palette and then I put the arrangement of the colors here. And then I leave ones that occasionally I will add to them but I put plastic over the top of it so that it's actually um, protected. But anyway, this is my palette. They're from Blick, uh, very inexpensive, aluminum, lightweight. I have rheumatoid arthritis so that the weight carrying it is very important. Uh, all right, so what I want people to realize is that this is about finding the darkest darks in your scene. And I'm starting with this one because it's very simple. Uh, so what we're doing is we're going to look out at, for the darkest darks in a scene and we're going to put them in straight away first. <clears throat> in this case, um, I'm going to use a pencil. So sometimes I go into the scenes and I just freehand uh, without using the pencil. Uh, I establish my horizon line which is here, my design. I'm going to, you can move things around. You can change things around. Nothing is written in stone. You can, with watercolors, brilliant because you can actually lift it at some point. So this is just a really rough sort of sketch. 
And also I can erase my um, pencil. So this is a, again, this is a very rough, I'm going to, now, can you see my palette that I'm mixing? No. Eric? This is the ultramarine blue. I got busted. I was I was trying to fix my camera. <laughs> That's okay. Don't worry. You're having tr tr troubles with your camera. So what I've done is I'm taking the Van Dyke brown, I'm taking the cobalt and the ultramarine, and looking at this, this is a man in black, so there's some warmth in there. This is a blue shadow. So I'm just going to go in and paint fairly roughly. I have to get my uh, trusty paper towel. And I am wearing my Hallmark my, apron. My favorite apron. Yes. Show it again so everybody can see it because it's very special. Uh, see, it's little paint things. Oh. Yes, yes. And it gets, it gets very messy, um, which I have to wash. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to work fairly quickly for you just to show you the effect. And we'll do a number of these. You have to ask me questions. Anybody have any questions? Now, you can add a little water if you want to just get some variation in the shadows, shapes. They don't have to be dark at this point. This is an open box. What do you what do you mean? What do you mean an open box? Means that I have a lot of opportunities to do things. I can add a little brown into this one if I want to warm up that shadow. I can put some even darker, darker brown in here if I want to make this one even darker. All so right. the as watercolor, because of the water nature, you can drop color into it and it does its work on the paper. We do have a question. Yes. Barbara, when did you start painting? That came from Katie Manor. I started painting plein air uh, about 10 years ago. All right. But I'm an architectural renderer, so I just draw, I draw buildings all the time. Yeah, and somebody, J.M. Hansen, what paint do you prefer? Oh, I have a mix. Uh, primarily it's Daniel Smith, and then I have uh, Core. My sap green is Core. My cobalt blue is Core because it remains um, fluid all the time. It's, it's, it's a terrific cobalt. Um, let me think what else. Uh, I use Holbein. Brushes, brushes are a bit like um, flavor of the month. However, this black velvet has turned out to be quite an interesting. Okay. So basically, that's the formula. You've got okay. a painting there already. This needs to cook, and meaning dry. But I'm going to speed the process up because I want to show you some other examples. Before what kind of watercolor paper are you using? Another question. Oh, this is this is a Stillman Burn Zeta sketchbook. So if you look at it, I have paintings and sketches and notes in it. So now oh. the fun part is that you can start bringing in all sorts of things to this. I mean, if I want to, let me see. If that's my lightest of lights, I can put in some orange. This is where you can use your imagination. But the nice thing is that the storyline is here because your darks are already in it. It's a very exciting approach to come into watercolor this way, knowing that I can then run washes on top of all of this. Um, I mean, look what's happening here. <laughs> so that's the first little simple exercise that I want to show people that they can go in, take a photograph that has dramatic contrast in it, put it in in the darkest pigments. It can be the purples. I, advise, I recommend purples or browns or blues and 
then run washers over the top of it. And some of the washers can, they'll change the color of it. And then what you can do is because this color has changed, maybe I'm going to choose to put a bit of cobalt into this, which is not showing that well, to make it pop again. All right. I want to tell everybody our guest today is Barbara Tapp. And uh, she's a professional architectural renderer, but has become a plein air watercolor artist. And we have a gift for everybody. No, not for everybody. Ah, I got in trouble there. Uh, we have a gift today. If you leave a comment and we choose from the comments, no matter where you are in the world, and I see there's a big international audience on today, uh, if you put your, uh, make, leave a comment, and if you, pref we prefer you say where you're from, just so we can see, uh, we have an easel brush clip um, to give away today. So go ahead and, and leave a comment. And uh, Barbara will continue now. Okay. Okay. Um when you're actually working in the field or when you're working from a reference here um, as an architectural renderer, one of the first things you want to do is establish a scale that you can then reference later into your sketch. So I always want to know approximately where my um, horizon line is. I can change and vary any of the design of this, but again, I'm approaching it from the shadow shape direction. And Two of the givens in this particular example are these very strong triangles that are here in this elevation of the building. And if you're in the field, it's things like that that are gone as the sun moves. So you can imagine the sun goes in here and then the next thing you know is that the sun has swung around and it's facing the front of this elevation and you've lost those dramatic shapes. And for me, when I look at this um, building, it's those two triangles and then the fact that all this elevation is in shadow that I find very dramatic. All Here's right. my lightest lights, which is going to be here. So I construct my drawing. So I'm going to show you it from a, a drawing and analysis. Hello, Korea. Welcome. First time Korea I've seen. Hello, Korea. All right, you guys, so we're doing shout outs, so put it in the comments where you're from. Uh, so I'm going to go back to my brush <coughs> and put these in again, the darkest darks. Remember, you're out there. So there's going to be these two. You end up, it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. You end up creating a, a painting of shadow shapes. And that in itself, Eric is really fun to paint around. That is fun. Barbara, yeah. people are starting to put in the comments how many photos they have on on their phones. I see 9,000. I say I see 76,000 and 1,200 videos. That's CG York. I don't know where CG I don't is. feel guilty at all. Keep telling me that because I that makes me feel so good. Hello South Africa. Welcome to Art School Live. Right. So we can see how the shadow shapes are being built up here. Um, I love mucking around. And so here's the cobalt. So here's that bush that's in the front. Um, I'm going to preserve that area. These brushes are amazing because the tip is so fine. Tell us again what they are. People it's tuned black in It's black velvet, uh, silver, silver black velvet, and it's an eight round. From black from silver brush. Uh, okay, well, you said silver, right? Silver black velvet. Yeah. Three thousand s round. And yeah. This is so, an so the company is Silver Brush. So we're going to have to contact them and get them to sponsor because we'll, we'll probably sell about a thousand brushes for them today. Hey, listen, I have a dear sweet friend who's Australian who. She was. She and I go out regularly painting, and she's told me about these brushes. And it was yes, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got all these other brushes. And one day I said, you know, do you think I could try one of those brushes? And she said, sure. Anyway, I was hooked, totally hooked. Okay, so here we go. We're going to put in this. Now, can you see this amazing? Look, if anyone's into jigsaw puzzles, like I am. Um, to me, this starts to become like a jigsaw. And when you come in, 
I'm going to go a little bit more forward in this by putting in the sky, but I'm going to do it, I'm going to alter the colouring, even though there are brown trees up in there. Well, you're an artist. You get to alter what you want. Hey, this is play. Yeah. Hello, Netherlands. Hello. Let's see. I just saw some Sweden. Hello, Sweden. Welcome, everybody. Hello, Netherlands. Montreal. A lot of Canadians, a lot of British Columbia, a lot of different places. So there's my building now popping out. Yeah. So you'd laid in your shadows first, which is very unusual for water. Right. And so now, now I'm going to show you also by adding the green into it. And then I'm going to bring in another. I'm having fun mixing. Yeah. No pressure when, when uh, you've got an audience, we, um, we don't have a huge audience on live yet today, but in replays, we've had as high as 150,000. So no pressure right. painting in front of all those people. It's okay. I'm just playing. They're yeah. getting to watch me play this morning. Tell everybody how you and I met. Uh, to be honest, I, I had always been envious of my kids in summer camp. And I heard from, first of all, I came to one of the, plein air events but uh you like the, held like the, like the convention you mean yeah came i came to the con convention in monterey after i'd just taken up plein air painting for the first time and uh you advertised in your magazine fall color week yeah and i came to fall color week that's and pretty much you came, to the, came to the first one i think didn't you yes i did and for me, it was summer camp. It was quite an extraordinary event to come to. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking those shadow shapes and now I'm adding some color into them. Um, you can go as far as, so that the blue, this was another part of the dynamic part, ex exciting part of this whole process was that I realized that I could paint over the shadow shape blues or shadow shape browns um and so, so you could do like layering or glazing yes and what you're doing is you're preserving the drama i mean ultimately in watercolor we're all trying to work towards getting our whites that brings me to a point about oil painting I, i'm so envious of oil painting and gouache and pastel because they get to add their whites afterwards and my head has been saying well why can't i paint in watercolor like oil painters paint uh and so this was an aha moment in saying to me barbara yes you can do this you can get that drama without having to contrive to put it in at the last minute or um i don't know i got lost <laughs> that's all right uh so there's a question from the from maribel who says do you paint shadows first when painting in plein air Yes. Yes. Um, Eric, how much time have we got? Because I want to show some samples. You got plenty of time. I'd say we'll, we'll, we're willing to go up to uh, another half hour. Oh, okay. All right. So you can see here. But only for only for you. Oh, awesome. That's great. I'm, I'm very complimented. Uh, as long as I can still keep thinking of things to say and things to talk to you about. Um. So I'm putting in the little doors here. Uh, there's a nice shadow here, which I did not put in, which is going to be the, the chimney. Hey, Barbara, I just yes. checked my phone. 115,413 photos and 3,000, no, let's see. Yeah, 3,000 plus video, uh, 3,106 videos. <laughs> Ouch. I never throw anything away. I should, I guess. No, you know what? One day when I'm an old person sitting in the old folks' home and nobody will talk to me. I'll talk, I, I'll talk to you. I'll be right, right there. But to you. I'll be sitting there and somebody will be saying, What's she doing? Oh, I'm looking through the 5,000 
15 million photos that I've got of my life. Well, you'll be painting. The nice thing about painting is you can do it your whole life. And I have so many trips that I've taken, painting trips, and I take lots of photos. And my intent is to get back to those one day and, and uh, you know, do better paintings from them. But who has time? Well, one day might we might. I don't know. I'm I'd not say. I'm not going into an old folks home. You're not you're gonna have to <laughs> put handcuffs on me. Yeah, right, exactly. I, I mean I, I hope I'm the same. I'll be you. I'll still be on stage dancing. It'll be hundred and thirty years old and up there <laughs> dancing. Right. Um anyway, so so what it, my point here is that we start to get a pattern, we start to fill in the areas around it the painting starts to come together, but I still have my dramatic darkest darks that when I get to the end of the painting, I go back and I can actually darken them up again and again and again. So it, it's a process. This is a very quick abridged example to inspire people to try this. Um, I want to show you here um, an example I just did this week. So is that Good. Can you see that? Yep, 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 yep. Okay, so here's my here's my location. I'm on a country farm down in Armadon Valley with my friend Nancy. And there's my darkest dark shape. It's in here. And this is how I put it in. So I put it in with a much finer brush. And you can see it's fairly detailed. And then the next step was actually where I started to flesh it out with colour just adding bits of colour to it. This was still more of the shadow shapes, but I'm keeping that dramatic white. And then I want to show you the end painting of how it turned out. Wow. So Beautiful. here's the process of the shadow shapes. You don't have to put the whole story in first. You can work from an area and then expand so that your tones and your values are less than this. Hmm. You can see, I, I mean, I think that's a good example. I want to show you one more. So this was also on the same trip and a little bit harder to, let me see if I have these in the right order. Of course, I don't have them in the right order. Right, okay, so here's the beginning of this particular one. So uh -huh. I had really, very dramatic fence posts and fence lines as the, sink, the sun was sinking. And I put in all the blues, which are pretty much the same value, which would be maybe a seven. Yeah, I was going to say seven. And, and so then here's the eights and then here's the tens. Yeah. And then the next step, this gives you an idea of, well, actually, that one was a – this gives you the scene. Can you see the scene? Yep, yep, yep. And then bring introducing colour into this. So here are all my darks. I'm still putting in my darks. I'm putting in my next values lighter around them. You've got to look at the scene to find all those darks out in the field. And then the finished painting – turned out like that it's beautiful beautiful okay so uh i That's i want to i want to tell on you for just a minute i said oh, i'd yeah, tell a story tell on me. yeah so you and i were painting next to each other in uh acadia national park in maine for fall color week yes uh you'd been there at least two or three times and by the way that's where we're going this year and i'm uh, going are you of and, and you and I are standing next to each other and we're painting on the beach. Your, your head is blocking. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, and we're painting on the beach and this couple come up and they admire your painting. Now, please note, they didn't admire my painting. They admired <laughs> your painting. And what did you say? Um, I said to them, you know, why are you here? And the mom and the daughter said that they were, uh, the daughter was bringing the mom back to visit the place that her mother traveled on her honeymoon. And I said to her, uh, well, if you come back in half an hour, I'd like to give you the painting. I thought that was so wonderful, very generous. And you've started doing that a lot when you're out painting. Tell us why you do that. 
Well, I paint a lot outdoors, but I also realize that I'm capturing moments in time. And a lot of the time I'm in uh, locations that are very interesting, maybe geographically. Maybe I'm out there painting the Golden Gate Bridge and all these people come through and I just suddenly, you know, they'll come over and they'll talk. And so I decided one day that what about if I am nearly finishing and completing a painting that I offer to give it to them just as a memory for their moment that they spent and came to this particular destination. And the wonderful thing about it was that it turned into, they gave me in return a hug. Now, this is pre-COVID. Um, and it was also a time of life where I think there were so many depressing things going on that it it was really welcome to have some exchange of warmth between human beings. And consequently, I've had paintings that have ended up in uh, Istanbul. I've had paintings that have gone to Australia. Um, and I hear back from these people. I mean, so I established and broke my own boundaries and brought new people into my life and then shared the joy of actually uh, painting and doing what I do. I mean, they don't get a chance to reject the work. <laughs> and, and, and I said, and I went up to him afterwards. I said, S since you got a $2,000 painting for free, uh, I'd like you to spend that $2,000 on my painting. And I'm joking. I didn't. Yeah, really they got, you got no response. <laughs> well, you know, well, it's yeah. easy. So one person, um, Eric, when I was painting over at the Golden Gate Bridge, um, was very suspicious. Oh, my goodness. This woman was just like, what do you want? What are you after? Is this a scam? And I said, no, it isn't. Um, I'm just going to show something to you, Eric. I'm going to change my water and I want to show a little bit of an extra technique that I will employ. So here I have a door and I'm going to lift my watercolour. So just by adding clean water, which is, this is, you'll love my, my little water cup. Oh, Have I like it. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Bugs Bunny. He's, see, he's always laughing at me. He says, keep laughing. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you, Katie Smith says, I have the privilege of being a recipient of one of Barbara's beautiful paintings, Heart. What an honor. It is the only painting besides my own that I have allowed a spot in my studio. It hangs right next to my plein air equipment. Yay, Katie. Hello, Katie. That's sweet. Okay, so I've just lifted in the painting that door way there That's nice. from the shadows and then I can put in some details. Now I'm, I can drop in my brush. You, you can see this is very rudimentary. It's very um, loose. But the nice thing about, I think, watercolour is that we can come in and put in a lot of our detail later, which I call a calligraphy. Yeah. Um, you have to keep asking me questions. It's well, like the decoration on the cake. You, it's, yeah, except you, we can't lick our brushes. You also uh, came to the Adirondacks to uh, to no. our, our event, right? No, you, never been. I thought you did. I was coming. Oh, that's right. You were, and then COVID hit. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. We're gonna have a, a, that's a long way. It is. It's a long way. You know, it's hard to get to these places, some of them. Yep. Yep. Yeah, well, yeah, we're five hours north of New York City. We're up by the Canadian border. But, you know, you have to go up north to get that beauty, incredible beauty. I know. I know. But I've been painting just recently since COVID. Um, I had, a, an, again, another friend. <laughs> you have two friends now. That's good. I, I do. I do. You, I have a few. I have a, two, a few friends that I travel around and try. You and actually meet. made a lot of friends at Fall Color Week. I remember oh, that. Oh, my goodness. I made friends with Cynthia Rosen and Linda Piker. We we all came together in the same cabin, and we are going to reunite this year and come back together again, oh, which is awesome. going to be fantastic. So now I'm actually I'm going to put in a little bit more shadow lines underneath those so the eve is coming in. It really makes the dimension pop out now. It makes it three-dimensional when you do that. 
Yeah. And here's the little bit of Tom Lynch that happens is because there are these shadow shapes in here, you find that you have these wonderful white areas because you haven't actually joined things together. Uh, and that was um, something that he did. He who? He as in Tom Lynch. Oh, uh, Tom Lynch, yes. In the demonstration that he did at Watercolor Live. Here's a uh, comment from Anna, a question who's, who asks, what types of easels and setup do you all have for plein air watercolor? You are inspiring me to try. Anna, the first thing I want to tell you is, before Barbara answers that, uh, this week, or excuse me, next week on Wednesday, uh, March 9th, we have Beginner's Day uh, on an event called Plein Air Live, which is all about plein air painting. It's online. We have 50 top or 30 top instructors. We have people from all over the world attending and teaching. And we, uh, I'm actually going to be doing a segment on easels and packing and things like that. But also, um, we have watercolor painters. We have oil painters, pastels. So you can kind of get a sampling of everything. And um, Beginner's Day, it, you can attend just Beginner's Day or you can attend the whole week. And uh, so check it out at plenairlive.com. Okay, I've done my job now. Barbara, can you answer her question about easels set up? Oh, yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I'm, uh, I took up plein air painting because I had a French easel that I had bought and it sat for 10 years unopened. I didn't know what to do with it. Uh, so I took a workshop down in um, Carmel with Georgia Manser and she taught me how to open that French easel. Now, I don't use it in a traditional way. Uh, it, the French easel usually comes up and you use the, I don't know, the box. I use it flat and I use it like a tabletop. Yeah. Uh, however, I hate to keep plugging Watercolor Live, but at Watercolor Live I seemed to get, you know, I needed some some new things. So I went and bought a um, Plein Air Pro on plein air pro travel uh setup and it's a tripod and then it has a platform that you can put on top of it yep. uh, it's very easy to put up in the field i must admit and i'm enjoying it so the couple of paintings i just showed you uh, they were both done with this plein, plein air on plein air easel it's really up to the individual. I still love my trusty sawhorse, uh, which I call her, because she just doesn't blow over. These other newer models um, are lightweight and they need to be weighed down in the field. Now I'm going to take this blue. Sorry, I'm sorry I knocked that. Um, I'm going to take this blue and mixing up a Van Dyke brown and I'm applying it over the... And the reason you're doing that is you'll get more dimensionality and some of that blue will shine through, yes? Exactly. I have a really love, I'm going to change my brush. I wish I could show you um, some of the, uh, I want to get onto another painting actually in a minute because I want well, to show better you. better hurry. Pardon? Better hurry. Okay. How am I going for time then? Well, we've got about, I'd say about 15 minutes. Oh, good. All right. Well, if anyway. you guys are loving this, give a thumbs up or an applause so Barbara can feel the love. All right. Um, so that's that's this example of this one. Now I want to actually move to uh, this was another one. I'm not going to do it now. Uh, I want to go to this one. All right. This will be my final little bit of demo. Um, will, you, will you do me a favor while you're doing this? Um, yes. Will you just talk slightly about perspective? Oh, okay. This is a very good example. That's why I chose that one. Way to go, Eric. Okay, so I'm a perspective junkie. <laughs> I absolutely love perspective. Here I am. I'm standing in this uh, field, in this uh, yard, in a farm. And where do, I, where do I begin? How do I choose? There were so many things. How do I choose to do my painting? What is my intent? That's what I always ask myself every time out in the plein air situation is what am I intent my intent was I just was knocked over sideways by this wonderful 
rigid, man-made container so foreign and alien to this to this amazingly natural, beautiful, you know, hundred year old barn. And I wanted to establish this relationship of those two objects to each other in the uh, environment. And it was heightened by this dramatic uh, shadow. So Eric, what I do is I always find something that I will work as my scale uh, and I reference back to it all the time so that that keeps the correct proportion uh, in architecture. So the first thing I'll do is these are my boundaries. I think I'm getting the hang of how to do this demo stuff now. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Barbara. Yes. Uh, I would be honored if you'd come to Austin to our studio and record some art instruction videos. <laughs> well, you need to be very patient with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, you're doing such a good job. I don't think we're going to have any problem. Okay. So here is where I'm probably going to establish what my scale is going to be. And it's this edge, or it could be that square. It's not a square because it's diminishing down. You know, perspective, the lines of the roof tell you the directions in which uh, the perspective lines are going to go back to the horizon line and to your, uh, you know, it's very hard to say what, comes naturally <laughs> um, but these these directional lines are going off to a point which would be somewhere over here um, and each one of them they're not all on the same plane that's where it gets starts to get very complicated but for me I'm going to use this as my scale Everything's you remember be what Joanna Arnett said at, at uh, Fall Color Week about uh, perspective I think it's too long ago. Yeah. Well, she said, put a pencil in the middle of your forehead between your eyes and then, uh, and, and then look at that. And anything above that line angles down, uh, angles oh, down, yeah. so, anything below that line angles up. So that's establishing your horizon line. Yep. So, Eric, while I'm looking at this, if this is a help to people, um, so I, I established that these two lines – are going off to to the point here, but they're diminishing, right? They're going further away from you. This line is going to be taller. We use I use a spot or a dot system, and I it's like dot to dot. I was a graduate of the dot to dot book um, university, by the way, when I was young. Um, <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> oh, the uh, little the little books. Yes, exactly. So anyway, so so what you do is then you take a point here and I'm looking for the point that goes up here and I approximate my distance between the two. I put a dot. That's going to be the peak, the peak of the roof there. And it's sitting, if I drew a straight line down, it's sitting a little bit in from here. So I know that that's approximately where it's got to be positioned uh, and, and you construct your whole drawing this way if you need to do this otherwise I just freehand it I mean I know perspective so well um, this one here if I drew a line across here an imaginary line I will take this line here and I'm going to try and plot where that is this is all plotting I know that I go across to here oh that's going to be the end of the building and then if I take a, a distance from there across, I know that this is going to be the end of the building, right? Mm -hmm. I know that this point comes back to here at about that height. I cast across. That's the point of where this corner is. And then I look at it. I look at the shape. This goes to a point here, which is in relationship to that point there. I know this is complicated, but this is how it works. And I know that this roof is going to go in like that direction, and then it's going to change and go in that direction. Okay. That's enough of the perspective because I want to show you how to paint in freehanded the shadow shapes. Right. So my mind and my head is 
and my eyes are looking for exactly those sorts of points, all based on this container. I'm going to paint from left to right across the page because I don't want to go backwards. I'm looking for all my darkest darks. I'm just going to cram them in now. Remember that sun is moving. I'm going to lose the incredible dialogue of shapes and shadows. There's little, little legs here. And then I'm going to come in with a quick brush and throw in some of these. You want to be excited about what you're doing. So don't colour in the lines. Just get a feel. I've added some water to this. I've made it looser. As the shadow gets closer to you, the colours underneath come out. The, sun, the light changes. I've painted one, one little small section of this painting and suddenly look at the drama. Drama, drama, drama. You don't like drama. You know my rule about drama. Oh, I know. I know. Do you know how many times I say that to myself? <laughs> no. I do say it to myself. You, all, you, you always said that. I love this. Here's a beautiful shadow that's got the, si the sky reflecting into it. Look at the beautiful shadow there and how it's a light, maybe a three, but it's so dramatic against these three uh, shapes are what this whole thing is about. So I can actually put in this as a tone. That's almost the same value as we're gonna give we're gonna give you about five more minutes. Oh, five more minutes? Okay. All right. We'll just all right, that's fine. But we're um, getting the gist of it. Yeah, you are. I hope you've got the gist of this. I hope I look, all I want to do, Eric, with for the rest of my life is inspire people. It's so important. I just want people to go out and play and play with paint and experiment. Uh, don't don't be rigid in once you've found one thing to do. Keep exploring. Yeah, I started doing watercolor portraits because I was inspired from Watercolor Live. As you know, I was sick and couldn't host, but I got to got a chance to to get inspired. And all and then the other uh, the other day, I started doing a a bust in clay, and it it you know it's so freeing to try new things. And now you know it's informing everything. It's making me. Uh, better in my oil, oil painting and everything. So that is amazing. That is so amazing. Okay, I want to just say that in in this building here, I don't like this elevation. I'm finding it really boring. So I'm going to change it and put in my own opening. Okay. It's going to be in shadow. That door will be called Barbara's door. Yes, it is. So, and then you can do. I mean, play these these shadow shapes will all come out in the end. All right, so if we're getting closer to, I want to show you what this painting ended up like. All right. Have the courage also, change the shadow shapes into different color. Get that information down. Fast, 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 really fast. Oh, I want that to be pinker, 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 orangey. That's right. Possess. Sound effects while painting. I talk oh, to my, I talk to myself when I paint. Listen, I absolutely love painting with watercolor. It's clear. It's very obvious. <laughs> Come paint with me. I won't sing. Strict, strictly bathroom, strictly the toilet. <laughs> your daughter, your daughter is a singer, isn't she? Yeah, she is. She's in London. Yep, living, living her dream. Good for her. Yeah, it is. It's really cool. Um, all right, so I'm looking here. My lightest lights are going to be. This is going to be my brightest white, brightest white. I've got a, a light there and a light there. So the rest of the painting is got has got to. 
go around that. Okay, I'm going to show you the end painting. Beautiful. So you can see that was done in the field. And then here I took the hake. Rather than explaining the whole thing, it just using interesting brushes that will give you some interesting shapes. I lifted, so that's what this is, so that I can go back. But I think that that gives you the gist. I changed here over the blue. I brought in the, the color of the building. And then, of course, this popped the whole thing. So I can, I can just show you that last little bit here. And change up all your colors. Let let them run into each other. Let watercolor do what it's supposed to do. And have fun. All right, that's beautiful. Am I done? Oh well, I th you're not done, but you're done. Your time's up. Okay. All right. Well, Barbara, come back on camera so we can see you for just a second. Everybody can meet you. All right. Well, this is a bit risky, but it uh, is risky. Oh, there she is. Hey, hello. Barbara. Barbara is one of the most generous, sweetest people that I know and a fabulous painter. Barbara, thank you so much for inspiring us today. It was really a pleasure to have you on. And I do hope you'll take me seriously on my invitation. Uh, thank you. I mean, I had a pretty, sorry, I've got this around the wrong way. Um, I had a pretty bad attack of nerves, but, you know. Well, we'll overcome that. Yeah. Well, I, I, Eric, thank you. I just wanted to share with people the passion that I have. And um, thank you so much for me.